Okay, looks like that's working. So without any further ado, I'll call upon the first proposition speaker to open up this debate. Okay, great. I think I didn't specify this, but I prefer POIs to be in the chat. Thank you very much. Yes. The biggest purpose of the justice system is to reintegrate criminals. The best way we do this is when we give them a front row seat to justice. Two points on framing, and we'll then continue to two substantive arguments. First, how will this application process look like? We think that ex-convicts are going to be subject to an application process like happens in the status quo. Note that ex-cons to leave jails must have completed a process of rehabilitation and retributive justice that society consented to collectively through mechanisms of law. Over 80% of people in jail in the United States today are in there for violent crimes and crimes of context. As a result, we think that it is unlikely for murderers to get into these places, especially because to get in, ex-cons will have to go through background checks and interviews, like in the status quo, obviously with the consideration that they have extenuating circumstances because of this condition. Characterizing murderers in the police force will be extremely uncomparative for side opposition to the Second, we think that there are two scenarios we must clash in this debate. First, where individuals apply and don't get accepted. But second, a condition where they do and enter. Not clashing here would be damning for side opposition because their material, their material couldn't be impacted on either way. We think there are three conditions you should weigh on in this round. On ex-cons, on institutions, and on societal narratives, my third word will speak about. But first, First argument here will prove to you that this measure is necessary to improve the miserable conditions of ex-cons in the status quo and uniquely improves these conditions. There's two prongs here. First, on necessity, we tell you that in the status quo, ex-cons are largely discriminated against. In the status quo, the reason ex-cons can join the police in the first place is because there exists a narrative and stigma that they're all extremely violent. But the principled reason for the justice system to exist is reintegration, and therefore they have an obligation to extend mechanisms for reintegrations that are lacking in the status quo and counter this stigma. This means that even if this measure is ineffective, it is principally legitimate and therefore creates a condition in which the government best fulfills its mutual obligations towards citizens, towards ex-convicts. The impact here, panel, lies in the idea of safety nets. Crimes don't always occur in vacuums. Criminals are not inherently bad people and tend to commit crimes due to contextual conditions of injustice. Everyone has a right to be recognized as dignified enough to apply for a job. And this dignity tends to materialize in beneficial things for ex-convicts. In Portugal, drug addicts were given jobs at the peak of their addiction. And for that reason, they reintegrated effectively into society. They picked themselves up and 90 8% of them ended up quitting jobs. We think the, mechanis the mechanisms for people to reintegrate have to be proposed by the government. This narrative is especially significant because it humanizes conflicts. It gives them tools to achieve the very things that they have and adhere in their human condition. And it limits justifications of violence against them simply because they are ex-convicts. Note in the status quo, this causes conditions of unpunished police brutality, for instance, that cannot continue to go unchecked. Because this mechanism is separate from effectiveness, Palino, you must weigh it significantly because we proved two things. One, why this improved the police force, but two, why 
in principle, this was so beneficial because it dignified criminals and it helped them materialize their humanity. Yet further, if ex-cons can join, we think this measure creates three significant benefits. One, convicts are revindicated because the institution that oppressed them allowed them to enter it. Note this creates a unique tipping point towards breaking the stigma because the institution in charge of protecting you as an individual tells you it's okay, the institution you charge your, with your life with, the institution your trust is telling you that ex-cons are trustworthy as well. Panel, this is a unique voting condition because this debate's biggest impacts lie on ex-cons. On our side, we clearly benefit from them the most because even if they're rejected from this job, they have marginally better conditions for them in day-to-day -day society due to this destigmatization. But second, ex-cons are likely to be less stigmatized because police officers are constantly in contact with them. They know that they're people, they have seen successful conditions of rehabilitation. We think for this reason, it's likely that this job is beneficial for them. And for this reason, we think that if you want ex-cons to be better off, you vote proposition. I'll take your POI before I go into second. Yeah, what does the speaker think is the main reason why these ex-cons would want to join the police force? We tell you that ex-cons on both sides of the house are disenfranchised and lack opportunities. We think that's the mechanism on why they want to apply. We tell you that for that reason, giving them additional benefits to go in is significant, but we also think that there is a measure of revindication. These people want to show society that they are worthy of respect and are therefore also likely to join in the first place. We'll prove to you in the second substantive why this measure improves the police force. We tell you that allowing ex-convicts to apply creates four beneficial conditions. One, society now perceives the police as open to change and adjusting to the changing needs and narratives of societal behaviors. This occurs separately than if people want to apply or not apply. These benefits aren't contingent and therefore opposition can apply them as so. Even if this measure is ineffective, it still incentivizes an institution like the police to begin adjusting, adjusting systems that have been historically oppressive. Simply panel, the condition of the justice system becoming more malleable is beneficial because it can more marginally better serve society when it's open to feedback, when on our side it is not seen as a historical institution that never moves, but as something that can adjust to changing needs of society. Second, the justice system for the first time receives feedback. For true justice, this system needs to be constructed and serve the individuals it affects the most. We think principally the justice system falls when it ends up harming disenfranchised individuals more in a retributive justice scenario. On our side, one of the justice system's biggest actors, the police, are now accepting ex-convicts. In principle, here, the justice system gives them back the very condition of humanity that they lost, regardless of effectivity. This is why you vote proposition. On our side, you're constructing a system that serves the individuals it oppressed. Opposition needs to justify why the status quo is enough when it definitely isn't. Practically, in the status quo, having ex-cons allows policemen to have greater checks on problematic behavior when they enter these spaces. A marginal benefit proposition is unable to materialize, especially when we understand that policemen have become increasingly oppressive. But third, as ex-cons become increasingly integrated in the long term, we think criminals' viewpoints help the institution materialize systems for equity. Panel, these are the most effective because they directly respond to a context and condition of people who understand what the system lacks. So even if these changes are very small, they're very effective for this condition. Even in our worst case scenario where this measure creates backlash, panel, we think you weigh here on scale. Improving an institution that serves the entirety of society, the police, who today are not fulfilling their principled obligation towards those they're designed to serve, will always outweigh backlash or even a societal condition of distrust that can be created in our worst case scenario, because in the long term, we have greater mechanisms for correction of this mistrust as these institutions are constantly subject to feedback and are open towards responding to the necessities of citizens and of those it oppresses for justice. This is a clear proposition ballot. I thank the first proposition speaker. Invite first stop to open up their side of the debate.
Everybody ready? Perfect. Then my time starts now. Before moving on to a few key points of rebuttal and finally the opposition case, firstly, a clarification on the purpose of the justice system. It isn't to rehabilitate. That's a means of achieving the purpose of the justice system. The purpose of it is to protect the harmony and the general like fabric that keeps society together in peace. Don't be confused by side propositions framework on that. Look, firstly, I'm gonna be talking about their model and why it's inherently flawed. Then I'm gonna talk about this point on like humanizing criminals and the trust. And finally, on this idea that cops will actually become less oppressive or that the institution of the police force will become less oppressive. So firstly, on their model, look, they characterize themselves and pay close attention to how they did this. That the majority of people in prison were in jail for violent crime. And that like the people who would be accepted into the police force needed to fill, fulfill these like extenuating circumstances. Look, I don't think they can outframe and get away with squirreling the motion just to saying that it's going to be a minority of these ex comments that are going to be the only ones that have access to joining these like these institutions because that already like removes that the ability for them to access the majority of their benefits as to why the majority of ex comments are going to be able to reap the benefits of this change, right? So look, they need to bite the bullet on this because if the majority of criminals are all like in jail for like violent crime then that also means that the majority of ex-cons will be in the police because that needs to be proportional to the ones in jail right like that's very crucial and even the ones and pay close attention to the to this when they're saying that the ones that are turned away like look we're going to say that like if the majority are turned away then it's literally symmetrical to the status quo or like there isn't any in the in the police force but the only change on side propositions house is that a you get more wasted resources with the whole like application process and needing to interview all of them but more importantly it's going to build more resentment and it's going to build more stigma which is the very benefit that they're trying to claim look we flip that because we're telling you that when the majority of ex-cons were trying to access and be part of the police force are turned away because they did very bad things and they committed violent crimes, then that's going to be a problem because that's only going to create more stigma for the prisoners that weren't able to access those. And those are going to be perceived worse in society because they were not given the chance at, like, uh, at retribution by joining these institutions. That's why we feel we get more stigma and more resentment inside Proposition's house. Look, they're claiming also that they're going to humanize these people, but they can't claim humanizing if most of them get turned away because, again, you get that increased stigma to those. And and also, I'm going to clash this with a lot of my substantive on why we actually get more humanization with the exclusive alternatives that we get on our side. But finally, on this idea that cops are actually less oppressive in their world. Look, first of all, we think that these like idea that cops can only become less oppressive if you're allowing ex-cons like work at like as part of them is false. We think that they're like painting a very false dichotomy here. We think that actually we can get like the institutions to be like less oppressive still within our alternative because you're giving ex-cons the ability to effect more change and more on that later but you're also going to get this idea that like um cops need to uphold the rule of law and they need to stand for that and the public needs to see that they will always be upholding like a high standard of the rule of law because people who are cops firstly needed to respect the law as citizens and then as cops right so under this idea we're going to be clashing a lot but look first of all let me get into some points of framing look why do people commit crime first and foremost look there are three different types of criminals firstly we're going to talk about the ones that like are actually malicious in their intents they benefit and they want to benefit from crime and they have no remorse and therefore they have this incentive to join the police force because it gives them a leg up and my partner will be specifically dealing with that second of all we have people who may not be bad but they've made bad decisions be it because they have little discipline because they have a short fuse or they're highly emotional and that leads them to making very bad actions with high repercussion we think that the police by nature of their job needs to be very calm and very like even tempered because that's what allows them to do a good job and finally we think that there are people who like they said in their own characterization have grown up around entrenched poverty and then were pushed into doing that with that being said the second point of clash here is that the police have access to a lot of like information rich confidential records resources and insider inf information that'll specifically be dealt with in that second speech and finally this idea of stigma look we agree that whether unfounded or not like people generally have poor like uh, poor views or perceptions of criminals and that's because politicians have incentives to be tough on crime that's because the media likes to sensationalize the worst kinds of crime and we think that that's like exceptionally uh, and that's a, a truth in the status quo whether proposition wants to or not look the stance here is that the main metric or motivator 
for ex comets like they said, they want to redeem themselves in the eyes of the public because they want to be helpful and they want to be useful. We think that that is only off, like that can only happen in our side of the house where they aren't part of the police force because of two or three arguments from side proposition. The first is this idea of public trust and how that's based on existing perceptions. And second of all, why they can't actually help combat them inside props only under our alternatives. And finally, we're going to be talking about why it facilitates crime. Look, sec this first argument on like public trust and the frame, the premise here is the framing that we gave you on stigma and why people are already unlikely to trust cops. So when people see that the very ex-convicts, the ones that are like guilty of disrupting society, take jobs in these very high stakes position, you get that one, their decreased trust in the institutions that put them there in the first place. But second of all, there's a decreased trust then in the police force that is built of, of, of ex-convicts as well. Because the people that are meant to protect them, that can't live, uh, the people that are meant to protect, like can't actually live up to their very same promises because they were the same people who were disrupting their society to begin with. Whether it's true or not, there, we do think that there can be some ex-convicts with good intentions, but people are not going to perceive it as that. And that's why you get a fall in like this trust in the key part of the like law enforcement system. And that's why you see like an emergence of like saving vigilantism or people who don't trust the cops. So they take matters into their own hands. And that becomes like that creates a very chaotic society. And that like means like a myriad of harms in that sense. Before I move on, yes, a very quick point. On what, on your side, what safety nets do ex-cons have to reintegrate? That's literally my second point, so don't worry about it, I'm getting there. And second of all, let's talk about trust within the police. Look, police need high degree of trust in their partners, like not just in the office because of all this information that's like very confidential and very important that I framed, but also and especially in the field, like the person next to them, they need a trust them with their life because of the person in front of them that has a gun and that's potentially threatening both of their lives. What happens when the person next to them used to be the person in front of them? That creates for a very mistrusting environment and panel, this is very crucial. So when police officers can't trust each other, not only does it risk their lives, but it prevents them from actually doing a good job. And even from the perspective of the ex-convict, they're going to build more resentment because even if they have good intentions and they want to do a good job, the rest of their colleagues aren't going to believe that. And that's why they build a very strong resentment against their colleagues or the people that they're supposed to be wanting to help. And that's gonna be very bad for these stakeholders. But second of all, on this idea where they can't actually help and these safety nets that Team Mexico was asking me about. Look, what do vulnerable people um, like, in who like might be susceptible to crime respond to best. And that's why I think the very powerful thing that ex-convicts can do is prevent crime before it happens, especially or like exclusively outside of the like police force in the first place. Look, when you get a cop, for example, or like people who say are in these areas that are like filled with like entrenched crime, they see cops again with a lot of stigma because of the like harms that they've been done, right? They see them as racial profilers. They have a very bad perception of cops within these communities that are wrong that have been wronged by them so when they see someone who is part of their community and instead joins them they see them as traitors or as someone who like by their own job needs to put them behind bars because they were forced to commit crimes that they may or may not be in agree with but that's period right like these ex-cons will still have to put them behind bars so they can't be able to reach them or they can't be able to build trust or alternatives for example like being part of therapy of counseling of motivational speaking this is very important and exclusive to our house because of the fact that they're able to help them so much more because they're more likely to reach the very people that feel disenfranchised and that feel like they can't trust the police in their status quo, right? So under these framers, we're so proud to oppose. I thank the first speaker on opposition, invite second prop to continue their side of the debate. Um, am I audible invisible? Okay, please do all POIs through the chat. Okay. 
the stigma that ex-convicts face shackle them to disenfranchisement. We strip away harmful perspectives perceptions, we are so proud to reintegrate them to society. I'm going to note three things about opposition's case that largely take out the whole thing that they brought to you. The first thing is to note that what we told you in our framework was that 80% of the crimes are non-violent crimes. That means there's 80% of people that should have the opportunity to reintegrate. I think the fact that opposition one wants to straw man our case lost them a lot of relevant rebuttal. But the second thing to note is that they're in a double bind because they can simultaneously say that many people will join on our side that the harms are this bad, but they cannot also simultaneously, oh, not people, not many people are going to join because then that means that the harms that we present to you are not as bad as they want to say, we are not going to fall into vigilante chaotic society as opposition one paints to you. But the third thing is I think we can outframe a lot of the characterizations they paint to you. When I when, when tell you on our side, the, the, the fact that these ex-convicts are likely to enter a police force means that they will face training, that they will be told and treated as employees. I think the whole thing they want to tell you about, look at all the confidential files that they're going to be facing, look at how the violent attacks that they're going to be making are extremely unlikely because on our side, if ex-convicts are likely to enter the police force, they are going to be treated as such and if face necessary training, all that kind of stuff to actually make sure their job is actually sufficient. First question to answer then, where is the police force as an institution better off? Opposition's argument that they gave you was like on trust and why you need to be able to trust. Firstly, like people don't trust society, like society will not trust the, the, the police officers knowing that they're convicts, but also like between the co-workers and police officers, they're not likely to have trust because they have a huge stigma. I think the very thing, first thing to note is that they paint the status quo as a huge issue, right? That there's a huge stigma against these people, especially perpetuated by politicians. That is the exact same status quo that side opposition is defending, where these people have no alternatives, are shackled within the labels of ex-convicts, not allowed to have any opportunities to persuade. But the second thing I would note about this argument is that it just largely asserts that on our side, because people don't have trust in the government, they will simultaneously just take action for their own hands, go into vigilantism, go into a very chaotic society. I think they needed more analysis to warrant this huge huge impact. But let's talk about like the trust that people have. We already gave you a way off from first proposition that I want to highlight very clearly. On our side, sure, maybe in the beginning, people are not going to trust the police. But we think that when you are normalized and when more convicts are actually accepted into the police force, then the fact that there's more people that are exponents are normalizing the fact that these individuals are key workers within the police force. I think in the long term, we can get that trust, even in the short term, if there's a transition period, this is like natural, this is organic. We think on the long term, we get that trust. But let's also talk about like the co-workers, how they're less likely to feel safe, the whole perception of like them being ex-traders. I think for in the, I think that we can engage in the case that reintegrating them, sure, in the beginning, as I explained to you, they might feel disconnected, like, they may not be able to like work as best in the beginning, but I think the long term of it is really, really impactful because inside opposition, they do not have an alternative to even give them the opportunity to join that force, to actually work and collaborate with people. I think that's a huge part of, yes, so you're going to have a, a like small issues with coworkers. I do not think the harm that they paint to you was as big as they wanted you to believe. What did we tell you on the point of institutions? We gave you a second argument on why the justice system is so crucial in being open to having feedback. And this was a key argument that opposition one really was not sufficiently able to engage with. Because what we told you is regardless of whether ex-convicts join, the fact that you are opening up those applications for those specific individuals means that they're one step towards change because you're more likely to have individuals that can talk about their experiences in jail actually shed light onto perhaps the abusive natures in the status quo on our side we are re reintegrating and making sure like forms of checks and balances actually being transparent about what happens in the jail system materializes on our side of the house on that point and the huge principle that we brought to irregardless of whether these ex convicts joints of being open to feedback of being open to change is a better alternative than the status quo the second question it's going to be on ex-convicts, but before that, I'll take your point. Yeah, so under your model, like what metric would you use to like filter out these applications? Would they be treated as any regular applicant or is Understand. there a special? Police sources, 
are going to be as any other job, have job interviews, have background checks, make sure that a person is actually viable to take on that job and have to face that training. I don't think that the worst case you paint of us having extremely violent and just horrible convicts on the police force is extremely unlikely. The second question I'm going to talk about is where ex-convicts best off. The second argument they wanted to give to you are like why people like ex-convicts on their side of the house somehow counseling and some mechanism to support them. I think I would first note that there's no exclusivity of that point, right? Because they tell you counseling like this, it helps ex-convicts. If that already exists in the status quo, that is a mechanism that is parallel, that is not a benefit for their side. But I would say even if exclusive uh, counseling exists on their side of the house, I think the fact that you are giving them a job opportunity is a bigger benefit. The fact that you are recognized as someone to be given and worthy of a job, which is very, very different than in the status quo, where you are painted as someone who does harm and is an aggressor, you are not given a second chance. But I want to then bring back the first argument on reintegration and why the principle was so important, because they completely just, just dropped the principled obligation of the justice system, because if they themselves recognize that the point was to prevent harm, then the preventing harm is to make sure that people are reintegrated or actually rehabilitated and can function within society. We understand that ex-convicts aren't perfect, but on our side, we have better checks and balances for these individuals when they're reintegrated within society, maybe have a place and a police force are checked and balanced due to like a, having a job that requires like mental and physical capabilities. We think on our side, you have better mechanisms to treat and make sure that these ex-convicts are doing what the like the best that they can. I think the strategic value of this question is that we prove the necessity of the policy, right? Like why this is so necessary while in the status quo, you are simply leaving behind the most vulnerable individuals who require a job, who require redemption, who require an opportunity. Let's then move into our third argument on societal perceptions, where we'll prove to you that these harmful negative and stigmatized views of ex-convicts are enhanced on our side. This is directly going to engage on the worst case scenario that opposition wants to paint to you on why they're going to continue to be stigmatized, continue to have resentment. We think that the problem in the status quo, as both sides agree, is the fact that these convicts are perpetuated and seen as aggressors, not reliable actors, but also the fact that these are machine, like these police force and these individuals are machines of abuse. I I think there's two key ways that we change such societal perception. The first thing is that if these individuals actually join the workforce, they're legally fighting to be protectors. Like they go through the training, are taught to be safeguarding society. The role they take on as a police officer marginally increases and benefits the societal perception that currently exists in the status quo. I think the very fact that they applied to the job in the first place connotes that they at least want to have a job, keep it, therefore will actually make sure that they're safeguarding policies that they're going and aligning with what is necessary for the job. But secondly, on our side, we do think we can stem, we can humanize the police force, right? Because you are more likely to add nuance to the type of people that are included and represented within the police force. These individuals, ex-convicts, are directly those who have felt the impact of, of the justice system. We think that when they're included, when they're represented within the workforce, that humanizes them rather than just simply seeing as corrupt, seeing them abusive as in the status quo. I think in our absolute worst case scenario, where these individuals are violent, at least they are part of a workforce where they can be held accountable, can be seen by the public eye. I think that wins us even in our worst case scenario. We proved to you the necessity of this. We proved to you why ex-convicts absolutely left with no alternatives. We are so proud to propose. I think the second proposition speaker, no worries, Spain. I know it's easy to do. So just everyone make sure that you're setting your two to everyone so that the POIs go there. It happens all the time. Um, I invite second opposition speaker to continue their side. Okay, am I audible? Yeah, right, sorry. Yes, okay, great. Judge, I want to be very clear. Essentially, all of the benefits that Team Mexico gives you, as for stigmatization, as for benefits to the justice system, benefits to ex-convicts, are not exclusive to ex-convicts having access to a job as police. There are other ways to access those benefits on our side of the house, which we are more than happy to support and tell you from first. What we are not willing to do is worsen societal trust and make situations far worse with the harms that we give you that Mexico responds to very weakly. 
I want to look at two things in this speech, the principle then practicality, and then give a substantive point on how uh, Team Mexico side of the house increases crime, increases crime. So firstly, Team Mexico comes up here and gives it like a bunch of principles that sound great. You know, the idea that ex-cons deserve the ability to have jobs, that ex-cons deserve the ability to integrate into society, that ex-cons like deserve to be humanized. Look, this is fine, but why does this principle fundamentally fall? Because none of this is exclusive to ex-convicts being policemen. Look, they can have access to other jobs that are not in the police force. They can improve perceptions by interacting on a one-on-one -on -one le level with people within society. We would argue that, that in fact, that in terms of perceptions, that is far more effective than the hierarchical nature that we tell you of a policeman, like interacting with someone on the ground level. But look, they need to give you a tangible reason as to why this principle is exclusive to police, when in reality it is not, that principle falls. But realistically, that's less important in debate. More importantly is the practicality. First thing I wanna to touch on here is the model. So first of all, I want to be clear that most of the benefits they give you can be accessed without this model. Look, the perception of the police force as being static can be combated by things like which are already existing, such as the hiring of more minorities who are not criminals. For example, in the United States, we see constantly increasing levels of African-Americans participating in the police force. This is something that we generally support, but we do not support these people being convicted criminals. Look. The idea of like give, being able to give feedback to the justice system. This is something which ex-convicts are able to do without having access to the police force. I would also note that the police force is largely disconnected from the justice system and the courts. So we don't necessarily understand the mechanism as to exactly why once they're like a low level police officer, they will suddenly be able to like reform the justice system. I would argue that acting as someone who like, you know, like fights for this justice, like outside of the police force would be far more effective. But also look at this situation here. Look, sorry about like I'm not misunderstanding the idea of 80% of violent criminals, but even 20% of violent criminals who get freed from jail is still realistically a lot. I want to contrast this with the idea of the model being able to turn people down. So we have two different scenarios here. The first of all is that even if it's a small number, some number of violent criminals are now in charge of enforcing the law. Look, you're unable to inf like filter out all of these violent criminals with the vague model that Mexico gives you. The idea of saying that they go through a training program or go through a legally binding process is not enough to mitigate the harms of violent criminals who are likely able to get into the police force with this model regardless. Or you have the alternative here of so many people getting turned away because you have a fear of violent criminals being on the police force force that you are not able to access the benefits from proposition because you cannot change the perceptions or access the benefits if the police, like if ex-convicts are not being hired at extremely high rates. Look at the like exclusive harms we bring you though. The first of all is the opportunity cost and like a waste of resources if you're just turning people down. That's like minor. But secondly now is the stigma that increases for ex-convicts who are turned away and are not allowed to access this job. If they want to look at stigma, I would argue that the stigma is far worse for these people who now get turned down. If violent criminals are such a big problem, Problem, I would argue that that number will likely be very high. But secondly, the thing I want to touch on here is why people join the police force in the first place. So generally speaking, you have two reasons. Firstly, you have people who are well-intentioned. And secondly, you have people who are malicious. I'll touch on why malicious people are obviously bad in my substantive, but let's look at well-intentioned people. First, to note that Mexico gives a substantive argument on people being well-intentioned in the police force, which like drops all of our analysis we give you in first and does not directly clash with it. What do we tell you? That even well-intentioned police officers, if they're ex-convicts, are unlikely to help people on the ground because of the hierarchy that you see when they interact with people. Which is to say, it's unlikely you shift perceptions when the person that is the like police officer trying to perceive those perceptions on the ground level as to not commit crime and like that sorts of thing or is someone who has power over you, who has the ability to arrest you, this is unlikely to meet like the like universal like respect level that is necessary to shift perceptions on the ground. We would argue that things like therapy, things like counseling, things like, you know, like motivational speaking are far more effective at accessing those benefits because that power imbalance does not exist. But I also want to touch on this idea of trust, which is very important. Look, Mexico essentially asserts that these people are going to be trusted. This assertion is not enough for them to win this debate. Because look at the harmful perceptions of conflicts which exist, convicts which exist in society, and what is the mechanistic reason for this? Because the justice system tells people who are ex-convicts that they are bad people, and even if it's not true, this perception does exist. Therefore, the difference is now that this lack of trust, so like the difference in the status quo between like convicts in general and convicts specifically in the police force, is that trust gets extended to the police force, which requires public trust to function. And lastly, this idea here of long-term trust, they don't really mechanize why this is the case at all. Look, I think this is likely untrue because of the resentment from police officers who put their lives on the line to convict criminals who now they have to work alongside. But also the idea that this doesn't work with society because the knowledge that criminals exist is enough to lose public trust. 
And also because of the fact that interactions with cops, firstly, are very rare. So perce perceptions on a societal level are unlikely to shift. And secondly, because these people do not know that the cops were ex-criminals when they interact with them. Therefore, they are unable to shift perceptions on the ground level. All of those benefits they are unable to access on their side of the house. Note that the society is a majority in terms of perceptions and they are unable to access them. I'll take the point. Why would minority quotas counseling for convicts only exist on your side of the house? Look, we're telling you that sure, to some extent it is symmetrical. The difference now is the harms when it comes to things like trust. And when it comes to things like what I'm going to get into now, about facilitating more crime, that is what is not symmetrical. So how do you facilitate, facilitate more crime on Team Mexico's side of the house? First, I want to characterize what type of people that we're talking about here. We're looking at people who are like so deeply entrenched in crime that crime will always be a part of their lives. Look, they like grew up in lives, lives of crime. These are people who like don't have families, but have families in terms of the people that they interacted with in crime networks, in gangs. Extremely tight familia-like bonds, something which jail times can really not undo. Now, when these people have access to the police force, specifically ex-convicts having access access to the police force. They now have access to weapons. They have access to evidence, things like DNA or forensics, access to knowledge on police raids or like where the police will be patrolling at certain times, access to a police chief that can be lied to. And I also want to note here, why is this something that can like not be mitigated on, on like side proposition side of the house, assuming that ex-convicts are allowed on the police force at all as per their model, because there is no way to know when ex-convicts intentions when they join the police force, which is to say the only thing they have access to are likely, you know, like a record of crimes that they've committed. I would argue that like convicts are like realistically, if you want to look at like interview processes, it's very easy to lie and say that you are well-intentioned when you are not. Therefore, someone who's committed an armed robbery, if you're just looking at like face value, could be equally reformed and well-intentioned as they could be malicious. It is likely something that will always be a problem. So what does this look like? It looks like giving these people, giving false information to the police to force people to like, or to force them to pr protect criminals that they are friends with, to turn their back on crime, which is happening in certain neighborhoods, to take bribes from criminals because you are more sympathetic to them. Look, the reason that cartels are such a problem in so many countries in Latin America is because of things like bribes, which allow for this crime to happen. Note that the effects of things like bribery are very similar to the effects of ex of ex-convict police officers who are sympathetic to criminals in allowing crime to happen in the first place. The secondary impact beyond just more crime here is that when people see police officers being arrested, for example, for, for being moles, citizens and police officers both have de decreased trust in the police force. Remember why trust is so important, specifically in something which upholds justice and upholds safety within our society. And I want to be clear here. We understand that this might be an inherently rare situation, although maybe not. But look, even if it is rare, on any scale, the prop like the propagation of crime, especially coming from the organization, which is meant to deter crime, is unacceptable on a principled and a practical level. For all of these reasons, I am very proud to oppose. I thank the second opposition speaker and invite third prop to close out constructive speeches for their side of the debate. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Please make all POIs through the chat. When the justice system labels people as convicts, potentially taking their destiny from their hands, they have a responsibility to reintegrate them to at least mitigate the harms that they caused. First, I want to talk about the decision that makes Team Spain's path to the ballot extremely complicated in this debate, and it's in regards to the counter mechanism they bring. Two errors here. The first one is that they never warrant why this is exclusive, and this was even conceded by the second speaker, meaning that all of the benefits they claim under their side of the house can be easily absorbed for hours, and therefore this mechanism, thank you very much, helps us a lot. But note that they bank their case on alternatives like quotas and counseling, yet, yet never explain to you how they disappear on our side. We think that this is incredibly important. But secondly, they never take into account that they that they'll never improve a status quo that they themselves criticize that they themselves characterize as harmful that they themselves concede have stigma has no opportunities for convicts and 
still these mechanisms of counseling and all this aren't enough to fix it. That is precisely why we're proposing this motion. That is precisely why you only have a marginal case that we can largely absorb. So let's go into the first question, which is under what side of the house do we have better conditions for ex-convicts? They told you that ex-convicts, if they don't get into these jobs, they will be resented. First, we believe that they're more resented under your side of the house because they get no opportunity whatsoever to apply to these jobs. I think that therefore the mechanism and the narrative that you're sending under your side of the house is that no one that has stepped into jail deserves a place in a job in the like justice system. I think this is a lot more detrimental and that is one mechanism in which you get more resentment under their side of the house. But then they told you that the solution they propose is counseling as and therapy. Note that these aren't mechanisms of reintegration. These are mechanisms of rehabilitation. And I think that therefore, whenever they never prove to you why ex-convicts are likely to have access to opportunities like basic jobs under their side of the house, I don't think they can win the debate because they never explain to you how they're likely to reintegrate under their side of the house. But lastly, they brought to you a third argument on increased crime in which they essentially talk to you about this ex-convicts having access to guns and information and how dangerous that is for society. First, this is our complete worst case scenario, a worst case scenario in which you literally ignore the mechanism we gave to you in which this ex-convicts have to go through processes like background checks, have to go through mental health checks, etc. We think that therefore we largely mitigate this risk when we have these kinds of mechanisms implemented under our side of the house. But secondly, if they want to claim that counseling is so good and so effective on their, their side of the house, then we can like largely assert that these ex-convicts are being rehabbed effectively and therefore the possibility of them doing these kinds of actions is very small, taking them at their highest ground where those alternatives are even slightly better on their, their side of the house. I think that's in the moment in which we can appropriate this analysis and tell you that because of that rehab process they're less likely to like reintervene but lastly we talked to you about the importance of having a job we talked to you about like an experiment done in portugal where they set drug dealers to have jobs and they stopped being involved in these types of crimes why because having a job it's having a form of literally being busy with something that isn't crime, of literally learning to coexist with other individuals. We think that therefore, because they never prove to you a single mechanism as to how they will get jobs for these people, they can't claim any of these impacts. But what did we tell you in regards to this? We brought to you a first argument on ex-convicts in which we told you at first, they're in a space in which they're less likely to be stigmatized. Why? Because policemen believe in the power of the justice system system because policemen are less likely to stigmatize like this ex-convicts whenever they have seen success stories of convicts that have come out of jail successfully and that have like undergone trauma and still were able to thrive. Therefore, we understand that if these people get in, the kinds of jobs we can guarantee are a lot better because they're marginally exposed to less stigma to whatever job opposition wants to claim these people can get in. But second, even if no one gets into these jobs and they're rejected, we believe that those that don't get into the justice system will be benefited because they're seen as valuable people. Because the police forces are sending a narrative in which they're telling society as a whole that these people can be recruited for these kinds of very important jobs. I think that therefore this has a trickle down effect in which if the police forces trust so much on these people to be able to have an important job such as being a policeman, then it is very likely that this trickles down into other kinds of jobs, into other kinds of industries, because the institution provides this trust, because the institution tells society that these people are valuable. Before I move on to my second question, yes, your POI. Yes, a clarification on exclusivity. You've been running up and down your bench that the like the, it's exclusive benefits of like re, that reintegrating is exclusive only under your model, and yet you're trying to take away the benefits of alternatives. So which is it? Is it exclusive to making them part of the police force or not? We think you, you we think that 
what you're confusing is that you're literally giving us an alternative rehabilitation, which is something that we also have under our side of the house. Reintegration is the exclusive part. So secondly, under what high side of the house does the justice system become more efficient? They brought you a first argument on public trust in which they told you that A, they're going to get access to extremely confidential information. First, literally the way the justice system works is that they go up rankings and therefore they start getting more important cases when they prove themselves as trustworthy this is not only something that happens with convicts this is something that happens with literally every single person that gets into the police forces we think that this wouldn't like stopping the case on their other side of the house but secondly we tell you that these policemen get trained and therefore they have mechanisms of checks and balances to prevent leakages even in our worst case scenario i think we outweigh this because they're basing themselves on an extremely small probability but then they talk to you about decreased trust in the institutions. They talk to you about how the public has no trust. We believe that the trust towards the police isn't very big in the status quo. Both teams can see that. In the moment in which they give the characterization on vigilante groups already existing in the status quo. So therefore, even in their best case scenario in which this is true, at least on their our side of the house, this wouldn't be a huge change because this is a condition that already exists and therefore that entire point is very marginal. But then what did we tell you? We brought to you a second argument on the justice system in which we told you at first, this uh, justice systems are more likely to be open for change in the sense that now ex-convicts have a right to be heard because they literally belong to the institution. They can criticize jail. They can criticize all the things they went through when they are a part of the institution and the institution legitimizes them. But even if this wasn't the case, we talked to you about the importance of having insight in the mind of criminals. We understand that particularly in the example they bring to us of cartels in Latin America, information that former cartel members can give on these kinds of cartels is extremely valuable. We think this is something worth fighting for because the police in the status quo is ending with mechanisms that actually promote justice. We bring it back. Thank you. I thank the third proposition speaker and invite third op to close out constructive speeches this debate. Okay, am I audible? Okay, then. Uh, I prefer my POIs in the chat, by the way. Um, okay, then my time starts now. At the top of my speech, I just want to clarify a bit on mutual exclusivity and what exactly it is inside opposition has been running up or down our bench in this case, because there seems to be a little bit of confusion. We tell you that a lot of the benefits side prop is pushing in their model, which from first, until third had been exclusively about integrating them and rehabilitating them solely through having them become police officers and then suddenly changed in third to try and co-opt all our benefits. I'll explain why they're exclusive in a second, but I just want to clarify the fact that like, um, right there. So they're trying to tell you that they can suddenly access all our benefits as well as theirs, right? By having it open to every single kind of rehabilitation and reintegration. And the extent of their rebuttal to a point about that being like, still mutually exclusive is that they're supporting reintegration and we're not. We think offering them alternative job opportunities is doing just as much to reintegrate them into society, i.e. they have a job, can pay them pay their bills and live in a house the same way any other regular citizen can, right? But the idea here on mutual exclusivity comes at the point at which police officers, the justice system and society in general, feels like it's fulfilling its role to these ex-convicts, right? As long as they are convinced that they are doing something to help these people by opening the door to them to let them apply to become police officers, it's like a sense of virtue signaling, right? They're going to pat themselves on the back for feeling like they've done something to help these convicts, and then they're not actually going to do something to facilitate all the convicts that maybe don't want to be police officers and want to like go back to school or become a therapist or become a doctor or whatever else, right? The reality is that they need a variety of opportunities and that when you're giving them one that seems like a holy grail but is actually not doing anything, you're closing a lot of other doors, especially when stigma exists, right? And then they tell us that like, um, Sorry, actually, I'll just move on to my cautious because I have a lot to get through. So I'm going to be doing this on a bit of like a stakeholder analysis, right? So first on ex-cons, I'm going to be weighing throughout. So they tell us at first that ex-cons are the most crucial stakeholder in this debate. Look, even if we take them at their best and say, we, st we still think we do more for ex-cons, but the reality panel is that there's a lot more at stake in this debate, right? Because when you're talking about something as crucial as the way that policing and crime is perceived generally by society, it's going to affect a lot of other things. And i.e., that's where it's important to consider things like the 
the way people perceive their justice system, the way police do their jobs, and also the way that future crime is prohibited or not. And this is where we also win on a long-term kind of scale. I'll talk about that later when I get to my final put of clash. But first of all, these S-cons. So two scenarios here. One is that they apply and don't get in. What happens here is that it builds a sense of resentment because they're offered false hope. They tell us them first, the majority are going to be rejected, so there's really no harm done if we think that it's dangerous for them to get in, right? So they're kind of preempting this idea that we're going to tell you that it's like really bad if they get in, right? The reality is that it's also bad if they get turned away, right? Because like I already told you, it's virtue signaling and it's going to close doors in other areas of opportunities, right? Because they feel like, oh, they have a job here. They don't need it over there, right? And the, like the harm that comes there is that these people feel like a system that like promised them help is now turning them away. And that's going to lead to more resentment and more feelings of like no dignity for themselves. It also just takes away the time that they could be putting in to better alternatives for themselves, right? To something that's going to do more for them rebuilding their like self-love after going through something like being in jail, which both sides seem to agree is generally kind of a traumatic thing. We think it's actually worse for their dignity when they're turned away, when they're trying to show improvement. We think there are other paths where they won't be turned away that are going to be sh like sh frowned upon a bit more in inside propositions world. So what happens if they apply and they do get in, right? A couple things here. The reality is that there's a long-standing public perception about criminals that is highly negative. It exists in almost every single level of society, except among the few people who can empathize with criminals because it, criminals who like don't commit crime out of like a hatred, but rather necessity. And those are the people who have committed those crimes or the people who like have loved ones who have been through that situation, right? The reality is the majority of society is not reflective of that, right? The majority of society is resentful of these people because of like the way that politicians are hard on crime. They tell us their rebuttal to this is that that's the status quo you're, you're like siding with. We never once told you that we think the status quo is perfect. We've been clear from the beginning that we want this stigma to change and it is only going to change if we decrease crime of necessity and other things like that again more on that later right then they then let's like take them at their best and say that like oh even if they are well liked and well respected by their co-workers once they get in the reality is they're likely going to be rejected from the community that they came from this is in the majority of cases where people commit a crime of necessity and then they go back home as one of the people who arrested their loved ones essentially and are now rejected by the people that they grew up with right this is because of the perception of criminals towards cops and also cops towards criminals right and they're likely still not going to be trusted by society even if they're trusted by their co-workers because they have a much lower degree of one-on-one -on -one engagement with society i.e if their co-workers trust them at all it's likely because they like see them day to day and see that they're a good person even though they perceive them poorly the average citizen does not get that kind of engagement and therefore is still likely to trust the news and general political like pushing that is anti-con um convict not communist my god then on the idea of the justice system and here i'm going to fit in like police and general people perceptions as well so uh, um, first, I want to start with like why police trust is so important. We already told you that the lives are at stake for these officers when they feel like they cannot trust the person sitting next to them because maybe their criminal buddy killed their last partner. That's kind of a really difficult thing for them to overcome the same way it is for the average citizen to overcome come the fact that the person who violated the justice system is now meant to uphold it, right? These are the kind of things that are really difficult to change in either side of the house, but we actually think that side prop is worse off for it because they're giving these people a sense of false hope that they can change it when they're likely just stepping into a work environment in which they're going to be disrespected and degraded every single day by the people that they're supposed to put their life into like their hands, right? So this idea of like whether the justice system is going to get more modern and better on which side of the house. They tell us that the only way to change a police system is from the inside. The reality is that we've already tried that and it hasn't really worked. That's why a lot of people around the world are protesting against police officers because they can't really fix themselves, right? And this is also where they lose this point about stopping criminals from getting in because of good training and stuff. They can't even catch bad cops who don't have criminal records. We think they're gonna have an even harder time at doing that when they do have a criminal record, right? And now on this point about like, uh, will, will people trust them, right? They tell us that like, that basically, again, they only attribute this to the status quo. The reality is that the impacts here are super strong panel. When people feel like the people who like committed crimes are now meant to enforce the law who when they violated in the past, they likely fear their own police officers. They think that the rule of law has become flimsy in the society and they are more likely to want to take justice into their own hands. This is where we see the law degraded publicly. This is where we see more violence and chaos in our society. There is a reason that police need to be highly trusted 
trusted by a people. The reason why the ACAB movement is so detrimental around the world, because when people feel like their police are not doing a good job, it destroys the integrity of the justice system and the democracy that these people live in. This is a huge impact that prop has not sufficiently combated. And finally, on this point of the future of crime, this is really, really important panel, because both of us want to live in a harmonious society. That's what police are meant to do, right? They're meant to eliminate crime, both by deterring future crime and also by catching the people that do it in the first place. Um, because like this is where we see the impacts of like financial pressure on jails, of the government system being overworked because so many people are committing crimes. And we again create more ex-cons who have to suffer through the consequences of our reality on either side of the house. The reason we do a better job of preventing this is because we encourage ex-convicts to get a better path to the people that are more likely to commit crimes of necessity. This is the crime that we can anticipate, and this is the crime that police officers cannot actively combat because these are the people who by nature are not trustworthy of police officers, right? I can think of very more, like, very few more opposing roles other than police officer and cop, except for maybe prop and op, right? The reality is that these future criminals are unlikely to be convinced by the person who might arrest them to change their ways. For these reasons, very proud to oppose. I thank the third opposition speaker and by op reply to close at their side. Perfect. Is everybody ready? Awesome. Then my time starts now. Panel, two questions in my speech. First, who gets better law enforcement? And second of all, who better benefits ex-cons and their futures? But first of all, a very important clarification on this issue of exclusivity. Look, we're not saying that alternatives and this can't happen in the same world, but that both of these benefits can't be accessed and that side propositions world is significantly worse off if they choose the model that they're running with. Look, in our world, in our best case scenario, we get our alternatives and the benefits that come with them. But in their side of the house, they're trying to take these benefits of their alternatives. But those benefits are nulled by all of the harms that we told you up and down our bench and that I've completely unengaged with, right? So we have the harms of decreasing public trust, which means that people are more likely to resort to like trying to protect themselves and vigilantism and self-defense that isn't warranted because they don't trust the police, because they see the police as like an institution that is being corrupted by people that have previously disrupted like the fabric and harmony of their society. But you also get decreased trust within the police, be it warranted with all the malicious intents that we told you. Yes, it's our worst case scenario, but that's not a sufficient response to get away with it, which is literally my entire my partner's entire second point that went unengagement. But we also tell you that even in the case where it's unwarranted and these people have good intentions and genuinely want to do a good job in the police, all it's going to do is because there's so much mistrust, there's going to be like a lot of resentment. And all it's going to do is that it's going to weaken the institution because it's going to make it very fragile and unstable on the inside. And of course, when you have an unstable police force, you can't access all of the benefits that they're trying to claim are exclusive to our alternatives. So look, we're telling you that they can't access benefits because they're also harming their own case and they haven't responded to that sufficiently. So first of all, who can it's better law enforcement. Look, three prongs to this. The first is trust, second effectiveness, and finally long-term progress. Look, the first thing that we told you in, pro in, in, in terms of trust. Look, in their side of the house, we're literally telling you that we have zero analysis that comes from Team Mexico when it comes to the fact that the public is going to have less trust in, in, in these people, right? They literally you just told us in a surgeon. No, they're going to have trust. And even if we get some mistrust in the short run, suddenly that's going to evolve into trust in the long run. We're telling you that by virtue of it being so mistrusting in the short run, all it's going to do is make it even harder for these ex-cons to like prove themselves because there's no valid channel for them to do that. We're telling you that in our world, we get far better trust. Why? Because first of all, we're giving the police and their institutions the ability to like uphold the rule of law that is so essential. And that's why people trust them, because that's what they're viewed upon, because they have very high standards for what like their own conduct as citizens, but also in terms of the things that they're responding. And the moment that you get people who violated that, you lose it, you loosen this idea that there's like trust in, in the rule of law and law enforcement. And second of all, this idea that like there's um, that let more people trust like ex-cons when they can reach people. And that only happens in our side of the house when you reach them as people instead of as cops. When you get one community that's been like violently affected by crime, they won't be reached by a cop because that cop, even though they empathize with them, if they're going to do a good job, which Team Mexico says that they're going to do, and to some extent we agree, by virtue of them having to do a good job, regardless of how much they empathize with these people that are affected by crime, they're gonna have to put them behind bars, period, right? And even we told you, even if that's not the case and they 
empathize with them to the point where they're willing to like skirt the law and like let them off. We're also telling you that that's obviously going to be harmful to society because they're letting criminals away. So under both of these frameworks, they're literally not able to reach people, right? So additionally, let's tell you why, like who benefits like ex-cons the most. Oh, sorry. And quickly on a effectiveness we're telling you because of malicious actors police's like main job is to literally focus on like trying to combat crime outside this is obviously going to be very difficult to achieve if they also need to worry about the person that's standing in the desk in front of them or that's going into the field next to them they won't be able to trust them if that person used to be the person in front of them holding a gun right but who benefits ex-cons look we give you a far more nuanced characterization of what ex-cons actually look like and we got no response from it we told you that there are cons that are like likely came from like entrenched communities um that that com communities that were entrenched with crimes. And we're telling you that these communities of ex-cons benefit from ex-cons reaching them again as people instead of like as a cop for these reasons. And second of all, we get the people that made bad decisions and aren't necessarily like criminals like by nature. And we're telling you that they're more likely to benefit again from therapy and from being reached. These people are unlikely to want to become cops in the first place. We're telling you on these grounds, we get far more alternatives. On these grounds, we're proud to oppose. I thank the opposition reply and finally call upon the proposition reply speaker to close out the debate. Let's take a look at two characterizations of side opposition that largely undermine their case. The first one is how they engage in what our side of the police force and actually going into these jobs would look like. We painted through since Valen Valentina's speech that we would have training, we would have job interviews, that these are things that are structurally within an employment uh, within an employment atmosphere. I think to sideline these mechanisms that we gave and create far-fetched scenarios of people taking and stealing weapons, of uh, creating like falsified evidence or very worst case scenario comparatives that side opposition wanted to engage in. But the second thing is it's about the counterfactual, the exclusivity of the things they defend, right? Because they wanted to bring you minority quotas, counseling, and theory, the, um, therapy. What was different between it was these are re um, rehabilitative mechanisms. These are not reintegration mechanisms. And that is why we can appropriate those mechanisms. And because if they already happen in the status quo, then on our side, the exclusivity, that you're literally giving them a job opportunity that is the mechanism and way back into society that is a benefit that the opposition can simply not claim. I think that by through painting the status quo of ex-convicts being that much bad, and they do not have the alternatives to actually enhance it, that, um, that already lost them the debate. But let's look at two clash points in the debate. Firstly, on ex-convicts and the perception that they have within society. They wanted to bring you two big pushes. Firstly, on the trust from society, how ex-convicts being in police forces are that much uh, are harmful. We told you that firstly, it does begin, the trust does begin to change when people recognize that the status quo is simply not enough. You need better mechanisms of checks and balances within the police force. On our side, you are making sure that those who have had experiences within jails who do have that impact from justice system were actually included are actually representative but we did give you a way off and sure in the beginning they might not have that trust because they are not familiar they're not aware of this condition in which ex-convicts are part of a police force but in the moment that you normalize it you allow more individuals to be part of it you do see that they are worthy of it that you do see that they should be trusted with that point but the second thing that they wanted to bring to you was on the resentment of those who are rejected we told you at least they had an opportunity to apply for a job. On side opposition, you do not have those opportunities specifically on a police force, which many people idolize. When you a police force themselves recognize that ex-convicts deserve a job, are valuable, are dignified for having that position, that is a big benefit on it of itself. What we told you, the first argument, was a principled obligation of why the justice system and the government have to make sure that people who have fulfilled their due, who have, who have fulfilled their debt to society are actually getting mechanisms to reintegrate. We told you 
that convicts are better or vindicated when you break the stigma and the status quo because police, the police force is recognizing these individuals as valuable, as someone that can contribute to society. That is a huge push that we have to counter stigma, a huge push to take away the damaging societal pressures that exist in the status quo. The comparative then is the alternatives on their side that somehow like magically appear on their side where the status quo hoping that these individuals can be included, that the government is just wanting and in the long-term hoping for organic change on our side, you are pushing and the government is actively pushing for these individuals to be included in jobs. That is the huge side on why you have to vote on our side. We are giving them the practical mechanisms, not hoping that the government in the future does something about it. The second small clash point was on political, um, like the policy, the police system as an institution. We gave you a second argument on why it was so important for the justice system to be adapted, to be open, to give you feedback, irregardless of if any ex-convict actually enters. Like the fact that you are opening up to more individuals to apply to actually have that feedback is a benefit in itself that it is damning that opposition does not respond to this case because if both sides recognize that the police is failing the status quo is simply not enough on our side we give a mechanism of pressuring of accountability making sure that the police system as itself is more evolving has more progression on our side we recognize the cracks in the justice system where convicts are not exclusive or disenfranchised on our side we give them the opportunity the key to well-being we are so proud to propose.